All right, it's my pleasure now uh, to introduce our next uh, speaker, Fiore Longo. Uh, she is Director of Survival International France and Spain. Uh, as, again, when you think about you know, NGOs and groups that have made and continue to make and will continue to try and make a real difference in the world for the promotion and protection of indigenous people's rights, I put Survival International right up there. I go to them all the time. It's essential reading. It lets us know what's going on in the world. Informed, fair, investigative journalism. Fiore uh, gave a talk as part of our IPLP Van Paul Foundation speaker series uh, that I still remember and our students still talk about. She is just a, a, a passionate but brilliant and strategic advocate for indigenous people's rights. And it's just a pleasure to have her who also has agreed to serve on our advisory council for the IPLP initiative on indigenous rights in protected areas. And her advice is always invaluable, insightful, and right on point. Uh, it's my pleasure um, to have Fiore come in here. Thank you, Fiore. Uh, you've got the floor. Hello. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. he hello to everyone. And thank you very much at the University of Arizona for this invitation, and especially to Robert and Melanie uh, for all the help, I will just put my timer so I don't talk too much, which sometimes it is an issue for me. Okay. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yep, you got it. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, great. Um, so today um, I will talk about uh, colonialism, racism, that is wh why we are here and how they are uh, interlinked. Um, but as Robert has said, we the problem with racism is that sometimes uh, we have a hard time realizing where it is or, or what it is, even if we know what it is. So sometimes it is very clear what racism and the colonial system that serves to justify it. Um, it is, and we see this image, and and we can straight away know that this is happening in colonial times, and this is um, um, uh, a racist image. What we are seeing here, or here, uh, it is Roosevelt. Uh, that I guess you know who he he was, and this is his uh, trip um, in Africa. He did in East Africa. He did a trip uh, at the end of the nineteenth century. Um, and he filmed himself, took pictures. So it's full of pictures uh, like this one. So Roosevelt was, uh, yes, he was a racist, but he was also considered uh, the conservation president. He's one of the most important and prominent voices in the conservation movement that was, bo was warning in those years. And this relationship between conservation and racism is not a coincidence. But while here in this picture, it's very clear what the problem is. We can really identify that there is something wrong with it today, with the tools we have today. Maybe we have much more difficulty to see racism in a picture like this. This is um, a documentary, actually, that has been uh, launched in Netflix, I think, a couple of years ago and narrated by Barack Obama. And what about this picture? Can, can we see racism here or not? Or here, another image of nature. Or here, the Lion King. All brains are shaped to think that this is nothing to do with racism. This is just pictures of nature, right? Pictures of nature that it's out there. It was created like this, it put there, and it's nothing to do with actually racism. But when we go on the field, when we go to visit these places, um, what we see is a different reality. And we see what I call the anti-racist manifesto and the reality in, in this in case in Tanzania outside the national parks is actually a manifest of anti-racism because this is how the world should look like if there wasn't been colonialism. We can see this is the same image I showed you before, one of the most important national parks, the Serengeti. Uh, which is a savanna with the, with the zebras. And this is actually how the image should look like um, if colonialism what didn't happen. We can see the houses of the Maasai, we can see the cows, we can see the zebras. And this image 
we that was delete from history we don't see these images in television we don't see them in the conservation organizations websites we don't see them in national geographic the images we see are images empty of people and we are being told that this reality is neutral it's objective that's how the world look like but what we really understand going uh, behind this wall of impunity uh, as i call it is that to create these images that are so harmful, a lot of people have died or have been killed or have been beaten. And we don't need to go to study the colonial times to understand how this happened. We can see this today. And I will show you just a short video. Hopefully it's going to work. I show you this video just just to um, to make you understand that the images we talk about images because racism is, is portrayed through images as well as colonialism. But those are not just images that stay in our mind. These images has a huge impact on the ground, and this impact is being paid by indigenous people. These are the Maasai in 2022. So I'm not talking about 100 years ago that were evicted from their land. They were being shot by the Tanzanian police to create a conservation area where trophy hunting would be allowed. The myth of the wild nature uh, that has this impact for indigenous peoples is, was born at the end of the 19th century. The idea that nature was, um, was pristine. Uh, this myth of wilderness is a colonial myth because of course, lands were portrayed as empty so they could be taken. There was nobody there, we can take it. This image was, as I said, was born at the late 19th century where we have uh, two things that are very important for the storytelling. One is the, the Darwinism ideas that then went on into social ideas of what is called scientific racism. Uh, and then we have the industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution. The more we destroyed in Europe and the United States, the more we were dreaming of empty spaces of nature where there was no destruction. And so in the United States, white uh, settlers created this idea of uh, these places are so beautiful. Uh, in this case, it was uh, Yosemite and Yellowstone, the first national parks, that they needed to be protected. But they don't need it to be protected from the industrial revolution that was taking place but they needed to be protected from the indigenous people who were encroachers. That's how were they described. Nature to be protected has to be empty of humans, but not all humans, some of the humans, because very soon the idea of wilderness comes together with the idea of tourism. There is certain people that can go inside these places to watch whatever they need to, to see or, or to enjoy nature, to, do, uh, to have an aesthetic relationship with nature. This idea then uh, was imported and imposed by the colonizers, the European colonizers in Africa and Asia during the colonial times. We are always at the same moment, historical moment, the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. The, the colonizers imposed in Africa many and in Asia many things, but one of them was protected areas. The entire idea was we nature is disappearing. Who knows why? The colonizers never thought it was anything to do with themselves. Uh, animals are disappearing, but we need to protect it. And the, the, the blame was put on indigenous peoples. Why? Because as I said, we were at, in the years of scientific racism. The idea was that European civilization, as what it was called, was the summit of every kind of civilization. And science, who had a very important role, was the only good way to see the world. And indigenous peoples under knowledge were uh, to criminalize, were superstitious were uh, not knowledge really, were, they were primitive. And these ideas keep portraying today, even today, and it's important for me to say this because we have the tendency to think that colonialism is over. 
Today, we keep using words that come from colonial times. For example, poachers. We refer to poachers, to, 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 we use the word poacher to refer to people that hunt to feed their families. Uh, and when, when a you, white person go to hunt in Africa, we call it a hunter because they hunt for a sport. And what we can see in this picture that I'm showing to you is the perpetuation of this colonial logic. The, the idea is that Africans or any person that is not white is to blame for everything that's going wrong in, in this world and white people not. We see a Maasai who has been turned in, from a killer into a lion guardian by a, a woman and she won the CNN hero uh, prize. The Maasai who has been living with lions for generations need explanations on how to protect them from someone who clearly uh, is, is not a Maasai. Then we have uh, this hunting uh, picture with the ex-WWF um, trustee, uh, who, uh, Peter Flack, I think is his name, who went to hunt in Africa and, and he does it for report, he's a hunter. The first protected areas were created as game reserves for colonizers. So the idea was the colonial, the, the white Europeans know how to hunt in a rational way, not like the Africans. They should stop hunting because they don't know what they're doing. They're going to hunt all the animals. This colonial history and these images reflect today in what are our policies to protect environment, the environment. Uh, the Maasai told me that their own money is poison to them, and they mean it really literally. When we see how we spend our money, uh, the money that is supposed to go to conservation, we see how these ideas of who we have to, what we have to protect and from whom are reproducing itself. I have this graphic that are not really, uh, uh, they're a little bit old, they have a couple of years, but more than a couple of years, but uh, it's the same thing now, just that I couldn't find graphics. They, actually, there is more money going to, to this kind of thing. So when we see the big funders uh, against what it called uh, illegal wildlife trade, um, we see uh, that, so this sounds great. So we need, of course, to stop illegal wildlife trade. And we see Americans giving a lot of money, Germans, um, as, as single states, but also, of course, the UNDP uh, and the GAF. Where we see where the money goes, so to, to toggle uh, illegal wildlife trade, we see that the majority of this money goes to create protected areas and manage protected areas and to law enforcement. What it actually means. <laughs> By law enforcement, we mean these guys. So the, these guys are, are, are the park rangers of protected areas. And I don't want to blame the park rangers. And this is for me very important because it's easy to say, oh, these guys are just violent, but these are just also victims from a system of oppression. The park rangers are employed, funded, and managed according with which NGO by big conservation NGOs whose, funded, uh, whose funds uh, come exclusively from or Europe or United States. These guys are working for conservation NGOs that told them, if you arrest people, if you confiscate their food, you are going to get money. You get a, a, a prime of performance, uh, a bonus of performance. And, and so uh, they, they have to do this work. The work consists in, again, protecting nature, what was supposed to be empty, from anyone who tried to get in that area. Their, their job is not to really tackle illegal wildlife trade, because we know that the root of the problem of poaching, of illegal poaching, is actually corruption. But they are not going to go to arrest the functionaries of the Congolese government. They are going to end up arresting the most vulnerable people, people who can't go to, uh, they're not powerful, they can't go to a, a, a lawyer. And this is what actually happened. The system put in place to protect nature end up criminalizing the people that depend 100% for living on those places. The myth of wilderness, as I said, is a myth. Those places are not empty. They have been emptied. They have been deliberately, through policies that were put in place in colonial times, make them empty spaces. And these are the, the people, or the park rangers are the people who are the armed uh, unit that protect those areas. So that wouldn't be empty otherwise. I will let uh, Paulette, who is a Baka woman, our hunter gatherers from North Congo, explain better than me what means for her everyday life a protected area. Okay. 
I think you couldn't uh, listen to the video, but there were subtitles, so I hope you, you got the message. Uh, so just to explain you who the back are, are uh, I have spent uh, many years conducting field research. So this is a video I, I myself filmed, and I spent many years with the BACA. And they are uh, among the most uh, extraordinary human beings I have spent my life with, I have to say. Uh, they have a strong relationship with the forest, so strong that they can't not live without the forest. They know everything about the forest. Going with them into the forest, it's just so, I feel so ashamed of um, everything I am because I'm just so useless. And they know absolutely everything of every single tree, uh, every single plant, every single stone. I just sometimes can't believe that these are the people who are beaten and abused and raped by park rangers funded by WWF and in other parts, African parks, in the name of conservation. This is the conservation we are seeing today. And I just want that you get it very strong when you see these images of wild nature around there, that this is the price that the indigenous peoples are paying for get these images. But independently of the human rights, uh, which is of course my main concern as I work for a human rights organization, I want to reply to the question if, if this model, despite all these atrocities that is funding and committing, is this model actually protecting nature? And I think that at just a trip of one day in any of the places I have been working with, it could be India or Congo or Cameroon or Tanzania or, or Kenya, can reply to that question, or India in this case. The question is no. What we see is when the indigenous peoples are being evicted from their land, everything can happen inside this land and at the, uh, inside this protected area. So we can see trophy hunting, which is what happened in, in Kenya, uh, sorry, in Tanzania, where I show you the video before the Maasai are being evicted for that. Uh, but we can also see mass tourism in Ngongoro conservation area. There are 250 vehicles a day, 250 vehicles a day that go inside and outside the crater, uh, so the, the area, sorry, not the crater. I have been there, I, I saw it, it's just impressive. You can even hear what someone next to you is telling to you. How that these can protect nature at all, that's a question. We have scientific studies showing that protected areas are not performing well. Uh, in terms of biodiversity protection. But we have also scientific data showing that indigenous peoples are the best guardians of the natural world and their territories, when protected, are performing much better than any protected area in terms of biodiversity protection. So why we have it there with scientific strong evidence there, out there, why we are keep, we, what we are keep supporting this model with our taxes and uh, also with our donations. And the reality is uh, a little bit what Robert was saying about the economy of power is that this model is serving a purpose. Uh, racism is also serving a purpose. Uh, it's justifying colonialism, but it's also justifying an economical system that is based on the destruction of certain people and their lands for resources. When we see, uh, and Robert showed one of these, um, uh, this graphic before, and when we see who is behind, or not just really behind, who is also up on top of these conservation organizations, we can see what the reality is. And this can help us to realize why this model of conservation was born in the first place. I told you these national parks were created at the end of the Industrial Revolution, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The idea at the base was, yes, we see nature is disappearing. We see nature is being destroyed, but we don't want to change our economical model. We want to keep on going on with industrial revolution because this is making some people very rich. It's the same with colonialists. We know what, why nature and animals are being uh, killed. It's, it's European elites that are hunting or are killing it or are exploiting the land. 
But we don't want to change that because that is, is uh, make people richer. And it's the same what happened today. We don't want to see this model. It's not just, it's just, it's not allowing us to see the real roots of the environmental destruction. That is nothing to do with indigenous people. It's not going to be solved by creating some random protected area in some place. It has to do with economical system that need to keep growing and keep growing and keep consuming and producing stuff to survive. And this is why this economical model, this model of conservation is supported by all these big companies that are among the most polluting companies in the world. The worst thing is that it's not over here, unfortunately, because now, together with these protected areas, we have a new land theft that I uh, that is called nature-based solutions. They usually uh, the conservation industry is very good to find catchy names to put into things. So nature-based solution it seems great. So now we have a biodiversity crisis, right? That is not being solved by protected areas, but now it's being proposed that it's the same model that doesn't serve the biodiversity crisis also helps against climate change. So we are being told that these protected areas are not just great because protect biodiversity, but avoiding deforestation, they can also help us to uh, compensate emissions. It's of course, this has been proved and proved once and again that there's not absolutely not working, it's completely false. But again, this is what they are doing. And uh, I have, uh, we, me and Survival International uh, have been uh, working in, in a project in Kenya where protected areas that have another name, they call community conservancies, but it's the same stuff, uh, have been created in the land of uh, indigenous pastoralists like the Maasai, the Burana, the Samburu, uh, and others. And they are uh, pastoralists, so they need land to graze their, their cows or their, their sheep, uh, according to the groups. Or their camels, and, and they are being not allowed to do use their land to that because they again colonial meat. They are accused of overgrazing. Another great invention by the British colonizer that keeps being used today. So they are not allowed to graze anymore in their lands. And it's not only that; it's now they uh, the the NRT, the name of the conservation organization handling this project, is being is saying that because they are not allowed to overgraze anymore more grass is going out, uh, is growing um, in, on the, on the, in this place that you can see the picture. So there will be more grass and the grass will absorb carbon. And so they can use that uh, to compensate emissions. So big companies like Netflix or, or uh, Angie, which is a French company, or um, uh, others are using these um, credits that are being sold by these avoid uh, emissions to compensate the real emissions. So we have done a report on this, uh, which is very interesting. And the, 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 the only thing I want to say about this, because it's very complicated how carbon credits work, is that while we know for sure these carbon credits are not do, are doing nothing, because they, they, it's an invention in the first place that indigenous peoples are overgrazing. So these carbon credits are not really tackling cal climate change, but uh, are also blaming indigenous peoples for a destruction they didn't cause. So indigenous peoples are losing three times because of climate change that is real and has real impact on their land because of false solutions to climate change, because they are being accused of, of, of destroying something that they, they don't. And also because the, nothing is being done to tackle climate change, so climate change continue to affect their land. We know for sure, and this is what we know, and science tells us that 80% of biodiversity is on indigenous land. We know it, it's there. What we need to do is protect their lands and stop destroying them. And there is something very concrete that we can do. Uh, we don't have to go uh, very far away or we, there are a lot of things we can do, but there's something more very concrete, which is to put a stop to conservation organizations that are actually destroying the life of these people. And not just because they are destroying the life of, of indigenous people, but also because they are distracting us from taking the real solution and putting the money where the money should go. And there is a bill in the Congress of the United States that is a stall and despite uh, some of the things I hear um, uh, today, the law is a stall in the Congress because there is no willingness both from the Democrats and from the Republicans to push the law. I, I have uh, talked with the staffers who both confirm from Republicans and Democrat side that WWF has been hardly, really hard lobbying the Senate and the, Cong and, uh, the House of Representatives. 
And I want to, uh, I, I won't uh, tell you who told me this, but it was a staff member from the Democrats who said, and I will quote, WWF called us a couple of years ago to ask us to stop the investigation as it was hurting their fundraising. So I, I actually would like to take this opportunity to ask the congressman uh, to put out this bill. A memorandum is not the same thing that a bill. We need, we need accountability. The problem with these conservation organizations is that every time we expose a human right violation, the day they go and say, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I didn't know about it. We are going to write some safeguards and policies. We don't want safeguards and policies only. We want a law. We want that they are accountable when they violate human rights as every other company out there. This is very important. Accountability just not only mean that they will pay for what they did, but that the indigenous peoples will get compensation. There is no justice without accountability. So in survival, we are, uh, what, this is what we do. We are an advocacy group. We are a campaigning group that tries to radically change public opinion here because the problem of conservation is not an African problem. We cannot just blame the rangers of the government of Congo, of Cameroon. It is also and mainly our problem. It's a model that was shaped by us, was created by us here in the global north and is funded every day by us. We cannot pretend it's a model that comes from somewhere else. So I ask you, uh, for the people that haven't taken action, we have put an action on our website, that I, there is the link there, um, to help us to tell the Congress to support this human right building. And, and, and schedule it, it's, it's a stall in the Natural Resource Committee. There is no intention of anyone to put it out there in the agenda. And I think it is urgent because with the 30%, uh, which is this idea that we have to double uh, the surface under protection uh, by uh, 2030, there is a risk, and the risk is actually not, not, not the, it's, it's real, it's happening, that more protected areas are being created and they won't be created with a nice model. They will, are created by the same organizations following the same ideas that I described today. And we need to stop this, and not just for indigenous peoples, we have to do it also for us. It's our planet at the stake. Thank you very much.